It's I'm Luke Copland at the University of Ottawa. I hold the, the uh, University Research Chair here in Glaciology and I study uh, glacier, ice shelf and sea ice changes mainly in the Canadian High Arctic. Um, so I work on uh, research on the glaciers mainly in the Canadian High Arctic and, and looking at how the glaciers are changing but also looking at how the oceans changing as well. So how we get changes in icebergs to the oceans for example, uh, changes in sea ice, changes in ice shells uh, in the Canadian Arctic. When we think of ice shells, we'd most typically think of Antarctic ice shells and they make up a large part of the Antarctic coastline. Um, in the Arctic, ice shells are much rarer and in the Arctic, the largest number of remaining ice shells, the largest area of remaining ice shells is on northern Ellesmere Island in the Canadian Arctic. And what I'm looking at is how those ice shells are changing over time. If we look back at about a decade ago in 2005, we had just over a thousand square kilometres worth of ice shelf left on northern Ellesmere Island. If you look at those numbers today, there's just over 500 square kilometres. So we've lost roughly half of all ice shells in the last, last less than the last decade. Um, if you think of what makes up ice shells, ice shells are that interaction between the ice that flows off the land and the ocean. So in places that are warmer, so places like Alaska, for example, where glaciers reach the ocean, they break pieces off the end and they produce icebergs. And there's no, there's no extension of that glacier kind of out into the ocean in a sense. In places that are very, very cold, when that ice reaches the ocean and interacts with sea ice, the glaciers don't break off and produce icebergs right away. They become preserved and fill up fjords, basically. Some of the ice in the fjords is made up from glacier ice. Uh, part of it is also made up from very, very old sea ice that becomes very, very thick over time. It grows both from freeze on underneath and accumulation of snow up on top. Uh, and together they fill up the fjords. And so a fjord that's essentially full of ice is what we would call an ice shelf in northern Ellesmere. Uh, and that's what we've been losing dramatically in the last decade or so. Yeah, when we look at the data, it seems that there's a number of different things that are happening there. Um, we're seeing quite a rapid warming in the climate. So we, we've reconstructed temperatures back since the 1940s. The climate in that area is warming at about half a degree Celsius per decade. Um, what's interesting when we look at the numbers is that when we break it down by season is that um, we're, not, we're not seeing even warming in each season. We're seeing in the recent past, a lot of warming in the winter and not actually that much warming in the summer. And, and for an ice shelf, an ice shelf cares about summer temperatures because it melts it, but also cares about winter temperatures because the winter temperatures essentially allow it to recover from summer melt, it seems. And so it seems that in the recent past, in the last decade, we've seen a rapid warming in winter temperatures. It's a lot less intense for the cold today than it was in the past. Um, so it means that those ice shelves, they can't freeze on that ocean water on their other sides anymore the melt that occurs and warms them up in the summer, um, that that heat doesn't get you know, doesn't get removed from the ice shelf in the winter so easily anymore. And so I think when the summer arrives now, instead of the ice having to be warmed up um, before that melting will start, that warming begins much earlier in the summer because it's not as cold in the winter anymore. So so the story, I think, in part for the ice shelves is the fact we've seen this rapid warming, particularly in the winter in the recent past. And the other big factor that we've seen is um, big changes to the sea ice. So we've all heard about the changes to the, the reduction in the extent of, of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And, and in the past, we'd have what we would call multi-year landfar sea ice that would be held up against the front of the ice shelves. And that ice would typically be anywhere up to a few decades old. And that would really be act as a protective fringe against the ice shelves. It would protect the ice shelves from the effect of uh, wind and waves, for example, and heat from the ocean water. But in the recent past, we've lost that multi-year sea ice, and it seems that as a response, the ice shells don't have that protection at their fronts anymore, and so they're also breaking up in, in relation to that too. Uh, it's likely the ice shells have been there for the last around 5,000 years or so, at least, and so it seems that within the last four and a half to 5,000 years, this is the first time that we've seen the loss of those ice shells in that time. So this is based on, on the dating of um, particularly whale bones and sediments, which people have recovered at the back of the ice shells, which tells you that there must have been open water to allow that material to get there in the past. Yeah, it's it's very difficult to know what happened before that. So it's yeah, it's very likely that when we had the last glacial period, so 18,000 years ago, that the ice shelves were there. Um, so it seems that they we did lose them in the past. It seems so around 5,000 years ago they they were gone, and presumably before 5,000 years ago they they were there. They were present at the end of the last glacial period. Um, but the the most the best dating that we have gives us that kind of five to four and a half thousand year date for when the most recent ice shells formed.
the, the short answer is I, Arctic ice shelves have contributed nothing to sea level rise. So Arctic ice shelves are very much like sea ice, that, that they're already floating in the ocean. So if you change, if you melt them, you don't actually change the water level. Um, you have to move the ice, of course, off the land into the ocean to change the sea level. So yeah, for ice shelves, it doesn't make any difference to sea, sea level rise. When we look at glaciers globally, um, the general pattern that we're seeing for glaciers, and this includes glaciers, ice caps, and ice sheets, is a general retreat and melt of those, of those features. Um, that pattern is, is pretty true wherever you look in the world. I mean, whether you look in New, Z in, you know, in New Zealand, in the European Alps, in uh, Norway, for example, all those locations are losing their ice mass over time. But when we say that, the, the losses that we're seeing aren't always even either with elevation or with location exactly. In most places we're losing mass, but there are some locations where we gain mass as well. When we look at the Greenland ice sheet, um, it, the responses that we see are very different at different altitudes. At high altitude above 2,000 meters, we're gaining mass. At low altitude, we're, we're losing mass. And both of those are due to warming of the climate. And it sounds a bit strange to say that at first, but when you warm the climate, you're doing two things. When you're warming the climate, which obviously allows you to melt more ice, um, so that's the obvious factor that we that most people think about. The other factor that the warming climate does is that it increases the amount, of, the amount of evaporation that we have from the oceans and therefore increases precipitation. So in the end, the way that the glacier responds, it's that balance between, well, is it increased melting that wins out or is it increased precipitation that wins out? In most locations around the world, it's the increased melting that wins out. But in places which are already very, very cold, if you warm those places, say the centre of the, of the Greenland ice sheet from a mean annual temperature of minus 20 to perhaps minus 15, there's still a dramatic warming, but you're not really changing the melt very much. But when you warm those areas, you have increased precipitation. So in those situations, we are increasing the mass because we're having more snow falling on the surface. But that's due to warming, the same way that the melting is due to warming at low elevations. So we see this, it seems to be a particular pattern in Greenland and also a pattern that we're seeing in, in parts of Antarctica too, particularly in East Antarctica, at very high altitudes. Um, so it's the balance between the melting and the snow accumulation that defines what we see in the end. When we, when we look at Greenland and there's been dramatic mass losses and those mass, loss, mass losses seem to be accelerating in the last decade to two decades. Um, so we're seeing slight mass gains at high elevations in Greenland, the very high altitude areas above 2,000 metres. But those mass gains are nowhere near large enough to offset the, the losses that we're seeing occurring at low elevations. Um, we've seen dramatic retreats in the length of the glaciers in Greenland, uh, dramatic accelerations of the ice as well. And, and if you're looking at the current, uh, in terms of the current numbers of uh, the current amount of mass that we're losing from the Greenland ice sheet, it's about three to 400 gigatons per year at the moment. And that's roughly doubled in the last 10 to 20 years or so. So it's a dramatic negative mass balance for Greenland. Um, it seems that a very important factor for ice motion is the amount of water that gets to the glacier bed. Um, because if the water gets to the glacier bed, it lubricates the glacier bed and then of course that allows the ice to move more quickly. Um, and so the increased melting that we're seeing on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet of course is producing more lakes on the surface, more melt, more rivers on the surface. And it seems that that water is making its way through the ice sheet in places the ice is a thousand, two thousand meters thick. But it's making its way all the way through the ice to the base of the ice sheet. And that seems to be a large reason why we're seeing acceleration of the glaciers. It's a base of lubrication. So it seems that much of it is driven by this kind of upstream melt input from higher up. It also, there's also some evidence that it's being driven from changes at the Termini too, that we're seeing in uh, warming of the ocean coming into the fjords in Greenland, that's melted the kind of underside of these glaciers, that's reduced the, what we call the back stress, the amount of um, stress that's holding the ice back. And as you thin that ice, as the glaciers start retreating, there's not as much there to hold them back anymore, so they start accelerating. So part of it, I think, is coming from upstream, but part of it's coming from downstream as well. If you think of glaciers in terms of water supplies, um, of course, on the big ice sheets, they're, they're not really a factor. But when we think of, of mountain glaciers, particularly in areas close to communities, and particularly areas which are close to communities where they're where the lower elevations are very dry. So good examples are Peru, for example, uh, Alberta, the east, east side of the Rocky Mountains. That what glaciers do is that they act as sponges, basically. So in the winter, they, they hold that snow that falls, and then they release that snow in the dry time of the year, which is typically the summer. So what glaciers do is they tend to even out the annual precipitation that falls. Um, 
and essentially allow areas to carry on to have agriculture, for example, in the summer, when otherwise there'd be areas that are very, very dry. When there's glaciers there, they even allow water flow um, and allow rivers to flow for the entire summer. Uh, if the glaciers aren't there, and we've seen this a little bit in, in Alberta and the Rockies, that we see changes in the, in the hydrographs over time. We get, in locations when we lose the glaciers, we get much more peaked hydrographs occurring in the spring. So much more rapid runoff as the snow melts in the winter. But then in the summer, that supply becomes depleted. There's no ice left, there's no snow left. And then you get much drier summers instead. It, it really shifts the hydrograph to being earlier uh, in the summer. When we think of the impacts of these water supplies, um, so in some locations there's direct impacts on water supplies for drinking water. So we see this in uh, the Himalayas a little bit, in the Alps for example. Uh, I think perhaps the, the biggest impact is on agriculture because you know, the, if you think of the, of the prairies that stretch east from the Rockies, there's huge areas that are fed by the, by the rivers that flow from the Rockies. Um, so I think the biggest impacts are really on agriculture and that sustainability in areas which are now becoming very, very warm in the summer, 30, 35 degrees isn't that unusual in the prairies in Alberta in the summer. Um, and if you lose that water supply, then the crops dry out. There just simply isn't the water there to, to water them. So, so when we look at the Himalayas, there, there's some, some very interesting responses that we've seen recently. Um, and there's been big differences between the area in the Western Himalayas, we call this the Karakoram, on the border between kind of Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, China. In that area, we've actually seen some increases in, in mass, uh, glacier mass recently. So the glaciers seem to be uh, advancing. Um, we're seeing uh, more surges, tells us that glaciers are more active. We seem to be seeing an increase in mass over time. And that's very different to what we've been seeing in the last decade or two for the eastern Himalayas in areas like Nepal, for example. There, the glaciers are seeing rapid retreat in areas around Everest, for example. So in the western Himalayas, it seems to be uh, tied into changes in the patterns of the monsoon. Um, so it goes back to the idea that as we're warming the climate, we're pulling more moisture into the atmosphere. So for the monsoon, it's driving the monsoon and making that monsoon perhaps more intense and pushing that monsoon rain further inland today than it happened in the past. And it seems in the Western Himalayas, this is an area in the Karakoram where the monsoon frequently wouldn't really get to very much in the past. Um, and it seems that as we're warming the climate, we're making the monsoon perhaps more intense. And now that moisture is pushing in further than it did before. And now um, allowing a lot of late summer snowfall in these areas um, and that's been, I think, part of the reason why we're seeing an increase in the size of the glaciers in the western Himalaya and the Karakoram, uh, much more than we're seeing really melting occurring in the eastern Himalaya. I, I think when we look at the Himalayas, the, the story is really very different. You, you, it's kind of difficult to make a generalization for the entire Himalayas. Um, I, I think on average, when you average out all the mass balance, we're losing mass, but it's, it's a very different story. The eastern Himalayas, we're rapidly losing glaciers. There's big concerns about glacial lake outburst floods, for example, as new lakes are being produced by glaciers, and those, are, those floods might then damage downstream communities in areas like Nepal, for example. In the eastern Himalayas, we're seeing lots of losses, but in the western Himalayas, we're not seeing those same kinds of losses. Um, it's not clear if those numbers exactly balance out, but, mm. but it's a very different story in the two different locations. So, so when we look at the Antarctic ice sheet, we, we often hear about it as being one ice sheet, but it's really two separate ice sheets separated by a very large mountain range called the Transantarctic Mountains. So East Antarctica um, is an ice sheet that's grounded entirely above sea level. What that means is that if we would melt the entire East Antarctic ice sheet, there would be uh, land left above the ocean surface. Uh, the ice in East Antarctica is about four kilometers thick. It's the thickest ice we have in the world. If we look at West Antarctica, it's a very, very different situation in West Antarctica. Um, there, the ice is thinner, a kilometre or two, um, and it's grounded below sea level. So what that means is if you took away the ice from West Antarctica, much of the area would just be islands, basically. The, the ocean would come into where the ice is right now. So when we look at the changes for those areas, the, the changes are, that we've been seeing recently are very, very different and have, I think, very different potential impacts. So in East Antarctica, it's very high and has been pretty stable. Uh, in some years or some decades, we seem to see uh, positive mass balance in some places, negative mass balance in other places, but not particularly big changes and not really any significant trends. When we look at West Antarctica, the story is very, very different. And in particular, there's an area in West Antarctica called the Amundsen Sea Embayment. This is the only part of West Antarctica that isn't fringed by an ice shelf. So it seems that the ice shelves 
for the other parts of West Antarctica, kind of stabilize those locations. But the Amundsen Sea faces the ocean directly, and you have these very, very large glaciers um, that reach the ocean. And when we're looking, when we've looked at the changes in elevations for those glaciers in the last decade or two, we're seeing dramatic thinning for those glaciers, thinning up to 10 meters per year. These are areas where we see very, very little surface melting. We can melt ice at maybe a meter, two meters per year in that part of the world from the surface, but we're thinning it by nine meters per year. So the question is, what's causing that thinning? It seems that there's two factors that are causing that thinning. One is the acceleration of the ice. So as you speed the ice up, it will thin it dynamically is what we call it. And the other way is that for that ice, there's now evidence that there's, in the last few years, that we have um, large uh, areas of ocean water that can, that can extend far inland beneath where those glaciers are. So it seems that there's melting occurring on the underside of those glaciers too. So it's not the story there, so we're losing lots of uh, mass from the Amundsen Sea region of West Antarctica. But that isn't really being driven by surface melt, it's driven by basal melt and this acceleration process. The, there's some evidence, at least away from Antarctica, that we're seeing quite clear warming over time, so to, down to many hundreds of meters of depth beneath the surface. One of the big issues for, West, for this region of West Antarctica, the Amundsen Sea region, is that it's really the most remote part of Antarctica that we have. There's no basis in this area. So we've started you know, working there the last 10, 20 years, but we don't have that long-term historical record to know what was there before. So it's hard to know if we are seeing warming of the ocean in that area. We're seeing warming for sure elsewhere in the Southern Ocean, but for that particular region, it's a bit difficult to know. Yeah, you know, when we look at Antarctic sea ice, it's clear that we've seen um, gradual increases in the amount of Antarctic sea ice in the recent past. And this is very, a very different story to the Arctic. So in the Arctic, we've seen rapid losses, but the Antarctic, we are seeing gains over time. Um, it seems that there's a couple of mechanisms uh, and perhaps many other ones that explain this. The, Two of the mechanisms that, are, that I'm familiar with is one, it seems that there's uh, been an increase in, in wind away from the continent. So that, that wind kind of does two things. One, it pushes the ice further away from the continent, so it makes it extend further north than it ever did in the past. And the second thing that it does is that when it pushes ice away from the continent in the winter, then areas of cold water which are adjacent to the continent become ice factories, essentially. And so more new ice is being produced all the time as the winds are increasing. Um, there's debates as to what's causing that wind to increase exactly. Um, one of the debates is, is that it might be due to warming, that as we're seeing increased in temperature, in changes in temperatures that are increasing between the continent and the surrounding ocean, that's driving increased winds. Um, and so those increased winds are pushing the ice away from the coast. The other thing they're doing for the ice is allowing it to ridge and to become thicker by pushing one piece of ice over the top of another piece of ice and that's a way to thicken the ice and allow it to then last longer through the following summer. So when we look at the latest IPCC projections, they tell us that by about 2060, we should expect global sea level to rise by about 0.25 meters and by about half a meter by the year 2100. Um, when we look at the, the causes for that sea level rise, um, it seems that glaciers and ice sheets are becoming increasingly important um, and the projections of their contribution have really increased in the last, well, particularly since the last couple of IPCC reports. And I think really the major reason for that is that now we're understanding glacier dynamics much better. So in the past, we just thought of global sea level rise from glaciers and ice sheets in terms of just melting. That simply if we melted the ice sheets, this is how long it would take to rise the global sea level. But we now realize that it's not just that simple process that, that if we start thinning uh, for example, the West Antarctic ice sheet in places, that will allow it to flow much more quickly. Same thing in Greenland too, that when we're accelerating the glaciers, it's a much more efficient and much quicker way to get rid of ice by accelerating it out into the oceans than it is simply by melting it. So that's one of the reasons why when we look at the IPCC projections that they really increased in the recent past, because now we're thinking of ice dynamics in addition to just uh, glacier mass balance. The, the, there's some debate, I mean, the, the half a metre that the IPCC is projecting by the year 2100, there's been many papers which have suggested that's actually an underestimate. Um, I've seen some papers in the last couple of years which have suggested anywhere from 0.8 to 2 metres sea level rise by the year 2100. Um, uh, and when you look at the IPCC report, I think the IPCC is very conservative in terms of the numbers that they give. They don't like to, to overestimate what they're doing. Um, if, you, if you take the kind of worst case, estimates of uh, glaciers accelerating and losing this ice through an acceleration of the ice to the oceans, 
Um, there's many estimates that, that are higher than the IPCC, uh, IPCC numbers. Yeah, I think when, when we look at the Arctic sea ice, then it's clear we do see big variations from one year to the next. I mean, it's, if you think of the weather from one week to the next, we see big variations in the weather. Sometimes it's, some weeks it's warm, next week it's cold. Um, but when you look at the, what's important to look at for sea ice is the, is the long-term trend. Yeah, for sure we see ups and downs, but we see a very, very clear, um, strong, negative uh, amount of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, a big decrease through time. So yeah, for sure some years are high, some years are low, but it's that long-term pattern that's the important one to look at. So I really started working on glaciers. I was an undergraduate at the time uh, in the UK. I started working just as a field assistant on a glacier project in Switzerland and then thought this is pretty neat and actually living in Britain never been to a glacier before and then went from there and did my masters in the States and PhD in Canada um, I started looking moving away from just kind of small valley glaciers into the larger ice caps uh, in the Arctic and the Antarctic and then it's kind of snowballed from there in a sense. So I think something that I try and do when I speak to the media is to, I think, stay very honest with the data and to, I, I kind of see myself as being a journalist in the sense is that I want to report the facts of what's happening without any kind of interpretation or I don't want to tell you if you should care about the facts or if you should, you know, care about what you should change. Uh, what I want to do is to present the facts of, of how the ice is changing, then it's up to you to believe whether it's climate change or whether should you change carbon emissions to have an effect on this? I don't want to tell you this. I, I, I want to be independent and give you the facts and then let people decide themselves what to do. I think you have to toe a fine line that, I mean, of course, you want to you know, provide the message of what's happening and, and you know, have your own personal opinions in terms of, I think, you know, what scientists should do in terms of you know, trying to reduce the effects of climate change. But, but I think it's important to be independent and to, and to give the facts of what they are without you know, that kind of emotional interpretation that they can have sometimes and, and let people decide themselves what they want to do with those facts. I, I think really the biggest questions which have really come to the fore in the last decade or so is, is how the big ice sheets are changing. Um, it's really amazing that in the 1990s when I was working my PhD we knew virtually nothing about Greenland or Antarctica. We hadn't even imaged the interior parts of Antarctica because it was so far, uh, so far south. So, so I think the most interesting scientific issues that we've seen really develop in the last decade or two are the changes to the big ice sheets. Um, and that's really come from a development of remote sensing. So in the 1990s, we hardly had any satellite images of the big ice sheets, particularly in the interior parts. And since the late 1990s and early 2000s, we've had a dramatic increase in how we can actually understand how those big ice sheets are changing. And that's really been kind of given us that, that big scale perspective of what we need to understand how that much ice is changing. In the past, you had to rely on kind of spot measurements from a few locations, but to get that really big regional picture, you need remote sensing. And that's been the huge development that we've seen in the last decade or two decades. Uh, and that's really revolutionized what's our understanding of how these big, big ice sheets are changing. Yeah, I think when I chat to people who don't accept the science, um, well, I, I'm not sure if, I haven't spoken to many people who don't really accept the science. I think people don't always accept the interpretations from the science. I, I think it's, it's very hard, it's almost impossible to argue that we aren't seeing climate change. I mean, when we look at really every weather, every climate station in the world, when we look at the glaciers, the permafrost, it's all telling us the same thing, that climate is changing. I, I think the, the question that I come up against sometimes is, well, should we care about it? I mean, the world's gone through, for sure, has gone through similar temperature changes in the past. Um, the world's done fine in the past. Why should we care about it today? Uh, I think it's, I don't see many, much debate about the fact that things are changing. I think it's more of a question of whether we should care about the fact that they are changing. I, I think it's just, in a, I think in a sense, as a scientist, you want to keep it simple and just present the facts, you know, without that kind of an emotional interpretation. And I think if you present the facts and make it clear that it's, you know, not one single weather station that's showing you one pattern. If you talk about you know, all the different sources of information that we have, whether it's from sea ice, glaciers, permafrost, snow, weather stations, um, all kinds of records, then they're all pointing in the same direction, basically. And I, I think, I, I find that when people ask me about climate change, you know, is climate change real? Then, then frequently you can ask people living in Ottawa, for example, 
and ask them, well, you know, were the winters that you experienced when you were a kid different from what we see right now? You know, was this, did you skate for longer? Was there more snow? And I think everyone says, yes, there was. I mean, clearly the, the winters the people experience today are very different to what they were 30, 40 years ago. Um, and I think when you put it in that personal perspective and people think back you know, and, and tell stories of these awful winters that happened 50 years ago and snow just the size of houses and this kind of stuff, um, when you put it on that personal perspective for them, then, then they can start to understand that things really are changing. People argue, well, we've seen you know, the climate be much warmer in the past. Um, and then, but then the big difference today is that we, in the past, there weren't seven billion people living on the planet. And there weren't huge cities next door to the ocean that are built for a sea level that existed 100 years ago, pretty much. If you think of New Orleans, New York, London, Venice, all these cities around the world with millions of people living inside them um, are designed for a past climate in the sense. So yeah, for sure we've seen climate change in the past, um, but there weren't seven billion people living on the planet when that happened. Mm. And so I think that's the difference today is that in a sense, it doesn't even matter what causes the climate change. May, maybe you want to argue that it's all natural change, but still the climate's changing and still it's going to have impacts. So whether you care about it, the cause of it is still will have those impacts down the road for things like changes in global sea level. Mm.